And so tonight we're in Mark chapter 9. It's great to have fun with our young people. Y'all help me remember about prizes. I'll forget unless you remind me. Okay, Mark. Gospel of Mark chapter number 9. We'll be focusing on two verses tonight. Young people, I'm going to ask you to sit up really straight and listen really carefully. We love you tonight. We thank God for you. Hey, last week when we were in our study here in Mark 9, we, we looked at the, at the first eight verses. Now we will look at Mark 9, verses 9 and 10. I'm going to ask you if you're willing and if you're able, just out of respect for God's Word, to give you a chance to stretch if you'll stand with me. Again here, please, and if you'll follow along, I'll read out loud. Starting in verse 9, going down through verse 10, the Bible says, And as they came down from the mountain, He, Jesus, charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. This evening I want to share a message with you entitled, Tell No Man. Let's have a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for the uh, fun that you've allowed us to have this evening, just uh, working with the young people and having that Bible drill and seeing their excitement and their enthusiasm, and most of all, to see them in the book. And uh, Lord, give to them and to us a, a, a greater hunger for the Word of God. Make us desperate for the Word and wisdom of God. And I pray now, God, that you would just fill my mouth with the words of Christ during this preaching time. May everything that's said and done honor the Lord. Lord, deliver us from distractions. Get a hold of our attention now and speak to us and give us hearts that are open and teachable and submissive. We pray this in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we mentioned a moment ago, the first eight verses in this chapter talk about the transfiguration of Christ. If you remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, what was on the uh, inside of Jesus came shining up on the outside. What a glorious sight that must have been. Quite a sight to behold. Listen to this, y'all. Would y'all agree with me that that... that moment of transfiguration on the mount. And it wasn't just that the Lord's clothes were shining like lightning, but also the Bible says His face shined like the what? Like the sun. And it wasn't just the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also two special saints from the Old Testament appeared. Who were they? Do you recall? Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. It's interesting because do you remember... When Moses had led the people of Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery, and God had uh, called on him to lead the people into the promised land. Yet remember at one point, Moses sinned, and, and God had told Moses, he said, Moses, I'm not going to let you go into the promised land with the people because of your sin. But here in the New Testament, we find Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that's in the Promised Land. By the grace of God, he did eventually make it in there, right? Yeah. And also Elijah, and, and so Peter, James, and John saw those two men speaking with the Savior, and then this cloud uh, overshadowed all of them. And there was a voice from the Father that spoke. Do you remember? What did the Father say? My beloved son. Yes, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Hey, young people, moms and dads, grandparents, Christians, everybody. God wants us to listen to what Jesus Christ has to say. Amen. And Jesus said, if you will hear what I have to say and then do it, you'll be like a wise man that built his house upon the rock. By the way, Jesus also said, if you hear what I have to say and don't do it, you'll be like a foolish man that built his house upon the sand. But the, the men of the inner circle, they saw that entire scene. Would you all agree with me? That had to be a spectacular vision. Would you agree? Yes. 
Would y'all agree with me that that had to be an amazing experience? Yes. Mind-blowing. Impressive. They would never forget that the rest of their life. But now, here in verse 9, as you notice what we just read in verse 9, now Jesus turns around and he tells those three men, he basically says this, don't tell anybody what you just witnessed. This spectacular vision. This incredible experience. Don't tell anybody what you saw until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And you think, why not? Are you serious, Lord? I mean, Lord, you were, your face, sir, it was shining like the sun. And your clothes, I've never seen anything like it before, Lord. Your, your clothes just shine bright white like lightning. And Lord, there was, there was Moses and Elijah. And then the cloud and the Father spoke and you don't want us to say anything? Why not? In just a few moments, we want to answer that question. We'll get to it shortly. But before we do, first notice this with me in verse 10. Look again in verse 10, if you would, please. It says, and they, that's talking about Peter, James, and John. They kept that saying, the saying that when Jesus said, don't tell anybody until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. They kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. Here's what I should share with you tonight. And, and this is going to help somebody tonight. And I'm not just talking to one or two of you, I'm talking to all of us. Listen to this. Right here in verse 10, we see that the, the inner circle, they didn't understand. At this moment, they were a little confused. They didn't understand. Listen, y'all. The apostles didn't always understand the Lord's methods and his message. And you and I won't either. We always won't understand what the Lord's doing. His word may not always make sense to us. I hope that you are, and I believe you are, I trust that you're reading through your Bible every day. I want to encourage our young people to be reading your Bible every day. And as you do, you're going to come across some things in the Scriptures that you don't understand. I kind of like that. Because if I could understand everything in the Bible, then I might be tempted to think that, mm, uh, you know, maybe a man wrote it. But the very fact that some of this book, it just, whoosh, it's beyond me, that's a sign to me that it didn't originate with mere man. Amen? But I would like to encourage you. That's one reason why God gives you a pastor. I'd like to encourage you if you don't understand the scriptures. For one, first of all, go to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, please show me what this means. Help me to understand the scriptures. But sometimes he might direct you to go to your pastor. By the way, guys, your husbands, we just finished talking about um, husbands and wives for the last six weeks or so. In the New Testament, do you men realize that the Bible teaches that when a, a woman has a, a spiritual question or maybe a, 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 some kind of a, a confusion maybe and I'm looking for an answer from the Bible. You men tell me, the Bible says in the New Testament, who, who are the women to go to first? Their husbands. Guys, you understand that the Lord's kind of putting on us, isn't he? He's letting us know, husband, you need to know your Bible. And when your wife has a question before she goes to any preacher or somebody else's husband or whatever, I want her to go to her husband. Amen? And if she doesn't have a husband. Yeah, then, yeah you can go. Sunday school teacher, by all means, contact your pastor. Okay. Good point. <laughs> but these men, they, they had questions. What was this all about, Lord? Why are you, what are you talking about rising from the dead? They didn't understand. And you and I won't always understand things. Sometimes in your Christian life, you will feel as if you are in Mark chapter 9, verse 10. By that I mean they had questions. The Lord was saying some things and they didn't understand. 
They were looking for an explanation. And that's normal for you. Whether you are a new Christian or long time in the faith, hey, uh, we'll never fully understand all of God's Word till we get to glory. Amen. That's just a normal thing. But I want you to understand that uh, you'll find yourself sometimes questioning and looking for an explanation and not understanding. But I just want you to hang on. Mark 16, 6 is coming. Let's hold your place there in Mark 9, please. I'm going to put my ribbon there and let's flip over to Mark 16, 6. See, the question they were having is they were saying, what did Jesus just say when he said, wait until the Son of Man is risen from the dead? They knew to whom Jesus was referring when he said the Son of Man. By the way, y'all, who was Jesus talking about when he was referring to the Son of Man? Himself. himself. He's called the Son of God, but He's also called the Son of Man. He is the God-Man. And so they said, okay, you're saying that you're going to rise from the dead. When's that going to happen? And why is that going to happen? Well, eventually they get the answer here in Mark 16, 6. This is the women. They had appeared at the empty tomb, and an angel is speaking to the women in verse 6, and he says to them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Now it's going to get back around to the apostles, and it's going to get back to the inner circle, and they say, oh, okay. We didn't understand chapters ago, but now we get it. Hey, l listen to this. This is going to help somebody. When we cannot trace God's hand... We can trace his heart. We can't always figure out what God's doing. Something he might say that speaks to our hearts or, or something he might allow or something he might not allow, it, might, it doesn't make sense to us. We can't, let's put it this way, when you can't track him, you can still trust him. Amen. When you can't trace his hand, you can trust his heart. You might not figure out what he's doing, but know that whatever it is, it's going to be good. It's going to be right. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we just have to be patient. Be also patient, brethren. That comes right out of James chapter 5. This is going to help you all if you all write this down. Here's one definition for patience. And by the way, we were talking about earlier about having a, a, you know, a, a youth group. A, uh, it's the last church where I served in as a youth pastor. God let us see the youth group grow. I'm not just talking about the little kids. I'm talking about the teenagers. And eventually, we started once a month. The teenagers would do the church service. The good thing. And this one uh, young, he was a teenager at the time. Now he's a grown married man with kids of his own. Blake Scurry, we'll see that on, online. Maybe he'll hear it. But Blake Scurry, he got up one night and preached on patience. And he gave a, a definition for patience I had never heard before. Hmm. And it, struck, it convicted me because I knew <laughs> it was talking to me. Here's what patience is. Calm endurance without complaining. Hmm. Calm endurance without complaining. That's patience. We may not always understand what's going on. Hey, by the way, Hebrews 10.36, listen to this, beloved. Hebrews 10.36 starts off this way. You have need of patience. You need to learn to endure things calmly and do it without complaining. Um, watch this. Hold your place there, please, in Mark 9. And flip over to John 13 for a moment, please. John chapter 13. Remember now, we're talking about in, in the story tonight, the, the, the inner circle... There was something going on. There was something that had been said that they didn't understand. 
And hey, it's going to be true for you and me. Well, there's going to be things in our life. There's going to be things that we hear that God's going to give your preacher a message to share with the congregation. Or God's going to give your Sunday school teacher a lesson to share with your class. And you're going to hear that message and you're going to think, I don't, I don't get it. That doesn't make sense. I need an explanation. That's, that's normal. Or God will let trials or difficulties or heartaches into your life. Just remember, when that happens, you remember John 13, 7. Look at John 13, 7 with me. Somebody willing to read that verse out loud for us, please? Go ahead. I saw your, first, your hand first, Paisley. Read it like a preacher. Perfect. Very good, Paisley. Thank you. Y'all, that verse meant so much to me when my home from my previous marriage was broken up. That verse. I'll never forget that verse the rest of my life. Because in the midst of that breakup and that heartache and the tears and the confusion and the hurt and the anger... The Lord gave me that verse. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing, you don't know right now, but you will know. Amen. Can I be honest with you? This is, kind of, this is not in the outline. Just a side thought. I believe the Lord wants me to share it with you. After the breakup of my home, and at the time, uh, I was living with my five girls and their mother in Waycross, and, and eventually their mother left and their mother moved up to Illinois, and, I mean, the state got involved. I mean, whew, it was heavy. It was some heavy stuff. And uh, the state gave the girls the option, and they were all ages like 12. There were two sets of twins there, so they were 12, 12, 10, 7, and 7, I think. And the state gave, and, and they chose to go m move in with their mother. And that was Illinois. Okay? Okay. A lot of confusion, a lot of hurt, a lot of heartache. And the Lord gave me that verse. Steve, you don't know what I'm doing right now, but you will. And he was like, as I was working on this sermon this week, I kid you not. It's like the Lord spoke to me and said, you look at the faces in that audience tonight. See, those girls, and this was very hard, and I have struggled with guilt about it over the years, that at one point, my five daughters said, Dad, would you move up here and be with us in Illinois? And I went to the Lord. I went to my family. This was before Miss Melanie and I were married. I went to the Lord. I went to my family. I went to pastors. I just felt like the Lord wanted me to stay here. That was hard. But now when I look out at your faces and I see somebody that got saved here, somebody else that got saved here, somebody else that got saved and baptized us, somebody else that got saved, somebody else that got saved. No. Oh. Maybe if the Lord had never allowed our paths to meet, they may not be saved yet. Right? So I, when you've got pain in your life and confusion, or like the inner circle, Peter, James, and John back in Mark 9, you've got questions. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. When that comes, you trust God. Amen. You trust His heart. And you know that uh, he'll, he'll show it to you. Not just these faces I'm talking here today, but her. Wow. A little heaven on earth when I go home. Amen. Okay? So some of you right now are in that time of confusion and pain and, and questions. You remember John 13, 7. All right, we've got to move on. Uh, 
the first point was the inner circle they didn't understand. And, and that's normal. You'll have times of not understanding. Secondly, also in, in verse 10, in Mark 9, verse 10, we see this. The inner circle were confused about, G the inner circle was confused, excuse me, about Jesus' apparent, it was apparently going to be an imminent resurrection. If you, if you read the, the parallel passages in Mark and in Luke, uh, uh, you'll see that Jesus is talking about his death, and the implication is, is that it's going to happen soon. And the implication is, is that his resurrection is going to happen soon. Well, here's the point. Um, that if, his, if his resurrection, if he's going to rise from the dead, if that's going to happen real soon, then that must mean his death was imminent. And so that's causing confusion. I mean, they had just seen their Lord on top of that mountain with his face glowing and his clothes shining and Moses and Elijah and a voice from heaven, this is my beloved son. And now he's talking about, I'm going to be resurrecting soon. Hmm. Well, Lord, to bring, be resurrected, that means you rise from the dead. That must mean if, you, if you're going to be resurrected soon, you're most going to be dying soon. Lord, that's confusing us. And we just... We just saw you glowing on the mountaintop. That's what we want. We don't want to be thinking about you dying. In verse 10, it's all confusing. It's confusing Peter, James, and John because they're thinking, your, your resurrection is imminent. You're going to rise from the dead here soon. But now for us it makes sense. Right? Amen. By the way, isn't this just, and I didn't plan this this way. But isn't this little passage just cool how it fits in with Easter this coming Sunday? Amen. And, and to be honest with you, you've heard me preach this sermon before, so I'm not going to re-preach it tonight. But uh, I know tradition says that uh, the Lord Jesus died on a Friday, but that's what tradition says. That's right. Okay? I mean, tradition says that angels don't have wings. I'm sorry, tradition says that angels have wings. You never find that in the Bible. Tradition says that Satan is in hell tonight and that he's wearing a red suit and a pitchfork. Mm -hmm. But you never find that in the Bible. Tradition says that Jesus died on the Friday. That's we call it Good Friday. But you never find that in the Bible. And when you look at it, for him to be in the grave three days and three nights, he had to have died on Wednesday. And I know our calendar is a little bit off now, but about 2,000 years ago today, mm. give or take a few years, is when he died mm. on a Wednesday. We know it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Bible tells us that. And, 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 but at this point in Mark chapter 9, none of that has happened yet. All they're coming is, and they're coming off this supernatural vision, this awesome experience of the Lord glowing like lightning, and now he's talking about dying. The resurrection is the ultimate. I want you to remember this. It's all clear to us now, although it was confusing to them. Now it's clear to us, and we see that the resurrection is the ultimate proof of Jesus' deity. I hope you write that down. The resurrection is the ultimate proof of Jesus' deity. And I'll read a verse to you to kind of back that up. Not kind of, it does. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is the ultimate proof of Jesus' deity. Secondly, it's all clear to us now. It was confusing to the inner circle 2,000 years ago, but today it's clear to us that the resurrection proves that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. Here's what it says in Romans 4.25. Romans 4.25 says, Jesus was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. When the Bible says he was raised again, raised again from the dead for our justification, that means that that was God saying, I approve of the sacrifice he made for your sins on the cross. Amen? Isn't that good? Hey, if, if God would have just left Jesus dead in the grave, that would have been a sign that God was not satisfied. Hmm. But the very fact he rose him from the dead said, pay attention to him. Look to him. And then uh, the resurrection...
completes the gospel message. It all makes sense to us now. Back to the inner circle back in Mark 9. It, it had questions. They didn't understand it. But it makes sense to us now. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the Bible tells us this. Paul says, For I delivered unto you first of all. That means number one priority. He says, The number one priority I had when I got to Corinth was not to make sure all the children had shoes, was not to go and, and you know, uh, uh, build homes or shelters for homeless people. The number one priority uh, I had when I got to Corinth was to get out the gospel. And the gospel was that Christ died for our sins, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day. Amen. And Romans 1.16 says that gospel is what a person must believe in order to be saved. Amen. That's why when we had the baptism on Sunday, if you'll notice, Pastor Steve asked each one of those people before we baptized them, we asked, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that He was buried, and He rose again the third day? And I'm sorry, I'm so glad that all of them said yes. Because if they would have said no, I would have said, I'm, well, I'm sorry, but I ain't baptizing you today. <laughs> because you've got to believe the gospel and be saved. And then you get baptized after you've believed on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, the inner circle was confused because Jesus was speaking about an imminent resurrection, which meant he was going to have to die pretty soon in order for that resurrection to happen soon. But now it's clear to us. All at the resurrection of all. And then let's wrap it up in our, in our, the title of tonight's message comes from verse 9, in the middle of verse 9, where Jesus says, tell no man. And if you'll notice in that verse, it says, he charged them that they should tell no man. The word charge means he gave them a strict commandment. I, what you just witnessed, I don't want you to tell anybody about it until after I rise from the dead. Now watch this. Uh, there was to be no reporting on what had happened. What had just happened? It was a spectacular vision, an incredible experience. The Lord says, keep it quiet. You know, let's have, we're almost done here. I want to have just a real quick Bible study with you. I, didn't, I ran out of time last week. We were talking about the transfiguration, and we talked about the Lord shining, and we talked a little bit about Moses and Elijah. Do you remember back there in verse 7, it says, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them? Have you ever noticed how many times in the Bible the scriptures make reference to a cloud? Watch this for my fjord your place there, Mark 9. And uh, young people, you know where Exodus is now. I want to encourage you to open up your Bible and look with me in Exodus chapter 13. If you'll listen fast, I'll read really fast, okay? Watch how the Bible talks about a cloud. To go through three different places in Exodus, and we're going to go to Second Chronicles and over to Ezekiel. Exodus chapter 13 and verse number 21. And it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a what, y'all? A pillar of a cloud to lead them in the way. That's the Lord leading Moses and Israel through the wilderness towards the promised land. And the Lord went before them in a cloud. Let's look at chapter 19, Exodus chapter 19 and verse number 9. Exodus 19, this is really cool. It's a long verse, I'm just going to read part of it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick, what y'all? Thick cloud. Watch this. That the people may hear when I speak. Doesn't that sound familiar, y'all? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened on Mount Transfiguration. Look at uh, chapter 40, the last chapter in Exodus. Exodus chapter 40 and then verse number 34. This is when the tabernacle had uh, been completely constructed. It had all been put together uh, as the Lord had directed, now look what happens next. Exodus 40, verse 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Let's look at just a couple of more examples. Second Chronicles. Okay, that's going to be a little bit harder to find. There's First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, Second Chronicles, chapter five. Verse number 13. 
2 Chronicles 5, 13 says, And it came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one. We believe that's going to happen at Lulatim Baptist Church one day, right? Mm -hmm. To make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. See, they are praising the Lord. They're telling him how good he is. Remember we talked about that Sunday night? that uh, after they started praising the Lord, that then the house was filled with a what, y'all? Even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Let's look at one more example. If y'all will understand, and just, just believe me, I could show you a bunch more scriptures, but just one more for tonight. Ezekiel. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, if you get to Isaiah and Jeremiah, you're close. Lamentations, right after Lamentations is Ezekiel chapter number 10. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 10, verse number 4. It says, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Now, y'all, for one, we want to understand how there's this certain cloud that represents the, the presence of God. Okay? <laughs> and this cloud that represents His acceptance on what's going on. And that same cloud showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, you can mark it down that Peter, James, and John, they hadn't been to Bible college. They didn't have a bunch of big degrees behind their name. But they knew the Old Testament Scriptures. And they knew about that cloud. And they knew what the Old Testament said about a voice coming out of that cloud. And you can mark it down after it all happened and they were able to get their wits back about them. They wanted to go running down back the mountain and say, Hey, everybody, we just saw the Shekinah glory. We just saw the cloud. But the Lord said, don't tell anybody. You see how the confusion and all the, the questions there? Now, we'll tell, I'll tell you this and we'll wrap it up. Why not tell somebody about it? I'm going to give you three quick reasons. Why not tell somebody about it? This is going to help us tonight. We'll say this and we're done. One reason why the Lord said, guys, I know you just had a supernatural experience. Uh, you just had a spectacular vision. You just witnessed something very amazing, but God lists, wants us to know this. We, want, we should emphasize God's Word over our own visions and experiences. Amen. Lots of people out there today promote their visions and their experiences. The Lord is reminding His inner circle, you know, don't emphasize the experience. Amen. I want you to proclaim my word. We need, that's going to help us tonight. Because we're going to have loved ones and friends that attend different ministries and various religious groups that they make a big deal of emotions and experience and visions. And if anybody had anything to say about it, these guys are Mark 9 did. But the Lord said, no, I don't want you to tell anybody. God's word is over our experiences. Secondly, a second reason why the Lord didn't want um, the inner circle to go telling people about it is uh, just think how the public would react. We don't have time to turn there, but do you remember when the Lord, in Mark chapter 1, the Lord healed the leper? It's in verses 44 and 45. And once the Lord healed him, he said... Go show yourself to the priest, but I don't want you to tell anybody about it. But the leper didn't listen to the Lord, and he went and he told everybody about it. And guess what happened? Somebody tell us. Started bringing yes. Crowds started coming in. And yes, the Lord had a heart to heal, but you see, these people, all they were concerned about was their physical needs. The Lord wanted them to understand they had a greater need for sin. 
And then also, um, in John chapter 6, do you remember when Jesus, he fed the 5,000, and the, the people just got so excited that, man, he could feed, he could feed, feed thousands of hungry people with just five loaves of bread and two small fish. And do you remember the people were started moving towards him. They were going to grab him. And what, they, what were they going to do? The Bible says they were going to do it by force. Remember? Mark, I'm sorry, John chapter 6 says they were going to take him by force and make him a king. The people wanted Jesus to save them from the Romans. But Jesus wanted them to understand there was a greater problem they were dealing with than the Romans. That's right. It's their sin. Nobody's doubting that the Romans are bad, but the Romans can't keep you from God. The Romans won't send you to hell. Sin does. Amen. And so he said, guys, I know you just had a spectacular vision. Don't go sell anybody. Because number one, if you do, you want to put God's word over visions and over experiences. Number two, you're just going to bring in crowds that are coming to see me for the wrong reason. By the way, folks sometimes go to church for the wrong reason. And then a third reason why he did not want his men to go out and tell what they had seen because he knew the enemies of the Lord would try to prematurely kill him. If the word got out. Remember when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead? I mean, the enemies of the Lord, now they were not only wanting to kill Jesus, but now they were wanting to kill Lazarus too. Because it was just going to draw, drive the crowds wild. Man, he could raise people from the dead. And if word got out about this transfiguration and Moses and Elijah and a voice, the Shekinah glory, that cloud and that voice speaking from heaven, it was going to be too much for the enemies. They were going to want to kill him right away. Hey, hear this. Jesus knew that he must be killed and rise again according to God's timeline. And he wasn't about to let anybody stop him. If you're in a time of confusion right now, hurt, you don't have any answers. You got more questions than you do answers. Be patient. Be patient. If we try to get in a hurry, we can hinder God's plan. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. I ask if you bow your heads with me, please, and close your eyes. and Just listen with me for a moment. We won't have like a time of invitation tonight, but I do want to ask you to listen carefully. Leave the camera running. Just remain seated if you would. Hey, uh, many of you are here tonight and you're saved and that's wonderful. And uh, even though sometimes it seems like we might be close to the Lord, sometimes things will happen, things will be said, issues will come up, problems will arise, it will confuse us. And it will generate questions. We want to ask why. What's going on? I want to remind you tonight of what John 13, 7 said. Jesus said, what I do now, you don't understand. What I do, thou knowest not now, but you shall know hereafter. Be patient. Trust him. Heaven is a place for understanding. Earth is a place for trust. But I wonder if there's anybody here tonight who'd say, Pastor, I'm just really not sure. I'm saved. If I were to die tonight, I don't know if God would let me into heaven. I don't want to embarrass you. I'm not going to call your name, but I do want to pray for you. Anyone like that, do raise your hand. Say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm saved. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the attentiveness of the people. Lord, as we get ready to leave here in just a little bit, help us to remember these truths. Lord, help us to be patient. Patience is calm endurance without complaining. Lord, make it so in our hearts. 
We have need of patience, Lord. We confess it. We pray for folks to get saved tonight, for decisions to be made for the Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I ask Miss Melanie to turn off the camera.